as you're thinking about this, it's not just prospective parents, okay? it's also prospective teachers or teachers, even if they never come to an Ambleside school or it's homeschooling parents, it's, we want you to think this is a way to be thinking about education. Charlotte Mason was fascinated with the latest brain research of her day and she wanted her philosophy and methods to reflect uh, the best possible scientific understanding of the way the brain worked. A hundred years later, uh, we are in the midst of what's really been a revolution in brain science. There's been a complete shift in the general understandings of neuroscience in terms of how the brain works. That shift can be summarized in the word neuroplasticity. Neuro meaning the neurons, the nerve cells of the brain, and plasticity, plastic, moldable, bendable change. 30 years ago, it would have been believed if you had a stroke and the parts on the left side of your left parietal lobe had been destroyed that governed your right arm, you'd never use that right arm again because the control centers in the brain had been destroyed. We now know uh, that through the right kind of therapy, uh, you can actually train the brain. The brain will retask other parts of the brain to replace the function of the part of the brain that had been damaged. Charlotte Mason argued for neuroplasticity 120 years ago. When we learn a new habit, we get a new brain. We are always training in habit. If you're an adult and you're with children, you are training in habit. The only question is, you're training good habits or bad habits. In a way, sadly, sometimes we never get a pass. Whatever we do is fixing the rails of a child's life in a certain direction, either for the good or for ill. That's why one of the reasons it's so important that we lay good habits early. It's a lot easier to lay down the rails in the right direction the first time than it is to tear up the rails because they were mislaid and relay them in a new direction. For the child who learns at 2-3 to give focused attention to the task at hand, to work with, oh, I used to use Lincoln logs or erector sets to construct and to give focused attention over time, to study nature, flora and fauna, to walk in the woods, to be still and quiet. You know, boredom is a moral failing. Anytime a child comes and says, I'm bored, what he's saying is, I right now am refusing to engage the world in a constructive manner. I want to sit passively and be entertained by the world. Sadly, all too often, we're teaching our children that life is about entertainment, and boredom, or the propensity to be bored, is a bad habit. I mean, we've, we've seen the child who comes home and goes out and finds something to do, some, something to actively engage. Another child comes home, plops himself down on the couch, and basically says, I'm bored, world come entertain me. Both are in possession of a habit, one which will lead to a much fuller, richer life, uh, another which will lead to really a rather uh, depressing depressive life. Let's talk about some other habits, particularly those that are relevant at school. Habit of neat and accurate work. A habit, as we've said, of giving focused attention. The habit of asking questions. The habit of being curious. The habit of working collegially with others. The habit of appropriate respect to appropriate authority. The habit of working hard, even when hand is tired. The habit of managing emotional distress well and staying your best self. This is actually a very, very important habit. And again, one we don't think of. In this life, you, every one of us experiences adversity. The capacity to experience adversity and not melt down but rather to manage that emotional distress in a constructive way is an extraordinarily important habit. How do we train, for instance, in the habit of handling emotional distress well? Well, there's actually been a fair amount of research done on that. I know 
that as a person I can lend my emotional support and emotional strength to you. And if we have a bonded, connected relationship and you're experiencing emotional distress and I come alongside you, I can give you my emotional strength. And by giving you my emotional strength, you can learn to process the adversity that you're facing and move forward. You learn from me. It is particularly important that I stay in a place of joy because if I'm in a place of joy and you're in a place of high emotional distress and I connect with you and you see that my level of concern rises, that I, yeah, I'm echoing to you that I understand there's a problem and that I care, but I'm not out of control. Somehow it's still okay, good to be me here with you. Then I lend you my strength and you begin to learn that, yeah, I can experience this adversity and it can be well with me. I think of one child who was very anxious about any sort of math problems. He was very competent, could do them, but he was afraid of getting behind, he was afraid of making mistakes, and so quite frequently math class would end with him emotionally melting down. And the way the teacher worked with him was simply to come alongside, say, in a few moments we're going to do math, it's going to be fine, I'll be with you and I'll help you. When she'd hand out the math problem, she'd say, let's start with doing the first problem. You don't, let's not be concerned about the others, we'll just work on the first. I'm gonna go look at the other students' work, I'll be back, I'm here, I'm with you, and I'm for you, it's going to be okay. Second, third problem, fourth problem, he starts to get a little anxious, a hand on the shoulder that says, it's okay, it's gonna be okay, I'm with you. Well, what happened over time, those little meltdowns became rarer and rarer. So what would happen almost every day, after a, almost immediately, it was less than every other week, and then it was once a month, and then it was, became much more the exception than the rule. He had learned through the support of a teacher to develop a new habit, one in which he could manage his emotional distress and stay his best self. Pity the 30-year-old who has not learned the habit of managing emotional distress well and staying his best self.